good afternoon, um, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're joining us today. Uh, my name is Jonathan Jaeger. I am a proud uh, BU Shaw alum, graduated in 2008. Um, I also uh, teach in the master's program, a course titled Ownership Strategies. Um, so I've had the pleasure of doing that for the last three years or so. Um, in my primary role, I'm the Senior Managing Director of LW Hospitality Advisors based in New York. Uh, we do hotel feasibility studies, appraisals, uh, we asset manage hotels and also litigation support, anything kind of hotel consulting, real estate based. And uh, very happy to, to join you today, uh, actually back in my office here in New York, which is a new, uh, a new activity for the last couple of months. But um, we've got uh, what I think is a really, really interesting panel for you today. We got awesome speakers from the industry, um, from both the revenue management side of the business and the asset management side of the business. And those are two that sometimes um, don't always agree. And so hopefully we can stir up some uh, little controversy on the, on the panel today and just really talk about two important disciplines in our business and how they've changed and what folks are doing now um, in, in the industry as it relates to COVID. Um, so really excited for our, our panelists today. I want to I wanna thank the folks at uh, Boston University, uh, Leora, uh, Dean Abnija, and Charlie, and all the other folks that help uh, market and put together the panel today. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes on in the back end, and so I'm, I'm excited to be uh, to be joining and, and be here today. Uh, so to start off, I'd just like to go, go through the panel, um, just a minute or two each, let everybody introduce themselves and uh, give you a little insight on their background and, and their experience. So uh, Roy, why don't we start with you? Right, thanks Jonathan. Uh, my name is Roy Maddock. I graduated from the School of Hospitality Administration, just like you. And I graduated in 2013. I also taught uh, for a couple of years at BU. I taught Introduction to Revenue Management, Advanced Revenue Management. And my current day job is the Vice President of Revenue Management for Real Hospitality Group. And we've got hotels scattered throughout the East Coast and through the country. And I'm excited to be a part of the panel. Thank you, Roy. Uh, Kim. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kim Gauthier. Um, I am the um, current president of the Hospitality Asset Manager Association, which is a group of about 250 individuals, um, asset management group that started in the late um, in the late 90s. Um, I have about 25 years of experience in the hospitality industry. I was with Their Lodging, one of the original um, private venture funds in the hotel space. Um, I was there for about 20 years. Um, multiple capacities, um, deal side, acquisitions, um, asset management, and um, a corporate controller. And I've been with Hotel Asset Value Enhancement. I'm a uh, senior vice president there. I've been there for about five years um, working, on, um, working on hotels and, and, and working with our owners uh, to drive value. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Eric. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Eric Hoverman. I am the Chief Operating Officer for Pyramid Hotel Group. Um, Pyramid obviously is a hotel management company. We have about 100 hotels under management. Uh, prior to joining Pyramid, I've been here, I guess, about two years. Uh, prior to this, I spent 20 years with host hotels, um, big lodging REIT here in the United States. Um, I've been in the industry for over 30 years. Um, it's probably the most interesting time that we've had in the industry during those 30 years. So, um, look, oh, excuse me, looking forward to the panel. Thank you, Eric. Really happy you were able to join us today. Um, and last but not least, Leslie. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Leslie. Um, I'm a partner at this assembly, which is a partnership of people who build companies. Uh, with our first company scheduled to, to debut later this year, uh, late 2020, and our second company scheduled for to debut in early 2021. Um, been in the industry for almost 20 years, uh, started off as a, at, a, at a gift shop of a five diamond resort, uh, leading me to go to hospitality school, from hospitality school at BU, to um, being in Starwood's second ever 
um, revenue management training class. So I've been a revenue management professional for the last 15 years uh, of, my, of my career. Uh, lastly, leading a revenue organization of 14 people, uh, of leading for about $100 million in room, in room revenue for a group of independent hotels based out of Portland, Oregon. All right, great. So uh, what I'd, I'd like to do uh, to start off, and, and I have to give the credit to Leslie for this idea, because this was a question we were going to ask at the end of the panel, but thought it'd be a good to start off um, with kind of the, the conclusion. And so obviously, you know, we've been through a very, very difficult period, you know, probably the toughest three or four months our industry has ever seen. So one of the, the main questions we're getting asked um, from an advisory consulting standpoint and from owners and from buyers and sellers and management companies is what year will we return to 2019 revenues, which was a peak year for the lodging industry all across the United States. So Leslie, uh, since it was your idea, why don't we start with you and then we'll go, why don't we go Leslie to uh, Eric, Kim, and then Roy. And I'd, I'd love to hear your answer and then your reason why for what year we get back to 2019 performance. Sure, and, and Jonathan, the reason I, I proposed that we kick this off was I think it really, does a great job of explaining the relationship between revenue management and asset management, which is you have two highly two groups of highly analytical people who use uh, real real time intelligence to inform them and make decisions. And, I, and and to land to the punchline is that I strongly believe it will take until 2023 until we see 2019 repair levels repeat itself again. And what that, what that also does is inform people to say that, well, if it takes 2023, you know, we'll, we'll take the rest of 2020, 21 to rebound, 22 to accelerate the rebound, and 23 to see annualized levels, well, that, that we're, we're in store for our two and a half year ramp up uh, before we get up to previous peak benchmarks. Eric? So um, I think I'm, Pretty similar to Leslie's view. I'm, I'm in a 2023 to 2024 uh, kind of range. Um, I, I think that there may be some political and tax structure changes that happen in the upcoming year, uh, and that may um, decelerate our ability to grow back as quickly as we might otherwise. Uh, bro, so. Well, Eric, and you're right. You brought up a great point. Uh, notice how I, I mentioned RevPAR. And it said when you look at um, profitability and you look at, at uh, other revenue streams, ancillary revenues, and uh, ultimately bottom line profitability, uh, I think there are so many, so many items outside of um, operating control that, that could push the, the profitability further back than after, uh, rev, after revenue, RevPAR. Uh, rebounds. Uh, Kim, what do you think? Uh, Kim, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, um, we're a little bit more pessimistic at Hotel AV. We're saying probably more like 24, 25. The data that we've reviewed that shows the last two downturns with 9-11 as well as the financial crisis for 2008, it took about five years to get back to the level. Um, I think the fact that the, the drop and the decline that we've had this time, that's, it's been much more precipitous and it's probably going to be um, everybody is hoping for what they call, you know, like a, a check mark in terms of it rebounding quickly. Um, but I do, we, we, we believe it'll take to 24 or 25 to hit the 19 levels, which is based on what the historical data shows us for the last two downturns. I'm going to second that. Um, so to, to your point, Tim, last time it was uh, $64 of REFPAR in 2008. In 2009, US REFPAR dropped to $54. That's a $10 drop. We've got hotels and markets that had a complete drop, right? You went to 0% occupancy in hotels. Mm -hmm. So in my view, four years at a minimum. Um, and that's not using any fancy maths. It's just looking at where it was last time. But I mean, a $10 ref part drop to recover from that, it took four years. I'm, I'm expecting it to take a little bit longer than that to, to fully come out of this. 
I know we'll get to this later, but I think that there are uh, group implications that arise out of this sort of long-term BT implications. And I mean, prior to us getting on this call, we all talked about when the last time we were uh, actually in the office and Jonathan's a brave soul that he's been in the office, um, myself, not so much. So I think there's, there's a lot that goes into this. All right, so I think we have a lot of pessimists on, on the panel because uh, the, the earliest we had there was, was 2023. You know, I think, I think it's interesting um, if, if you go back, and I remember a lot of the conversations we were having in, in March and April, you know, a lot of folks, and myself included, really thought the recovery would happen a lot quicker. You know, I think back then we didn't know how long this would last and when there might be a vaccine. I think we were more optimistic it was coming sooner. But now that we're sitting here in July, I read um, an article this morning, I think that said some schools in California are actually not gonna re reopen and, and go back in person in, in September. Whereas, you know, we were thinking now, okay, so September is gonna be where things sort of go back to closer to normal or as close to normal as, as we, we can be. and everything just every day that goes on it seems like we get things pushed back and that includes conferences and conventions with which Roy just alluded to which really drives a lot of business for urban markets and especially full service hotels so you know I still want to be optimistic I think I'm, I'm an optimist at heart um, and so you know if we have a vaccine by the end of the year early next year I mean maybe we'll be pleasantly surprised by the uptick in travel but the calamity and, and what's what's occurred over the last couple of months, the reduction in staffing, the closing of so many hotels, just things like Eric said, we never thought we would see um, in, in our careers. And so it's gonna take time to, to rebound. So I, I agree with our, with our panelists there. Um, one just quick housekeeping note, I did wanna say if anyone has a question they wanna ask, uh, feel free to type it into the, the Zoom chat window um, you can send it to the group or just send it directly to me and uh, I'll try to work it into the, the conversation. Um, so we have a lot to cover today, we have about 45 minutes left and um, I wanted to kind of break up the conversation, start with asset management and then go more deeper into re revenue management. But um, I wanted to start with a question to Eric um, and, and discuss you know, we've seen such an extreme reduction in operating expenses, frankly, more than I thought was possible to have a hotel open with so few employees and full-time equivalents. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what does that mean for the conventional way of thinking in how we analyze fixed versus variable expenses? Yeah, certainly uh, the change has been radical um, and has really, um, I think changed many people's view on this particular topic. Um, you know, as an asset manager, our goal was always to make more of the labor variable and less of it be fixed. Um, COVID obviously has substantially accelerated uh, this process. Um, and has really changed, I think, our mindset on, on what is fixed and what is variable. And, you know, we're kind of, our view now is, um, you know, food and beverage is variable. You know, you have to be open. We have uh, three people at the desk covering the 24 hours, um, you know, servicing uh, in housekeeping only checkouts that's kind of our minimum standard at this current point. And everything above that, from my perspective, is variable. And, you know, as a company, we're in the process right now of modifying our labor standards uh, in our labor systems to reflect exactly that, right? So that, um, you know, when we return, we look at things much more variable um, and almost nothing is fixed. So. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Eric. Um, I think that a lot of it is part of, I mean, I don't think any of us <laughs> thought that we would be as low occupancy wise and business wise as we are and how sustained it's going to be because of the virus and because of, you know, what's happening around the world and the vaccine, et cetera. So 
Um, I agree with Eric that it is that food and beverage has become more 100% um, variable. I mean, obviously, as the hotels come back, us as asset managers, what we're very focused on, you know, the first step was, you know, the last four months, um, reducing the cost, right, and flipping everything from fixed to variable, right? I mean, real estate taxes, difficult to change short term, um, but labor, contracts, all of those types of things that we could influence immediately has been done. And so now as we look forward, I mean, we're talking about stepped, stepped fixed increments of labor at occupancy levels that we've never discussed before. Like we're getting excited about 15% occupancy and what does the staffing look like at 15% occupancy versus zero and then 15 and then 30 and then 50. So um, it is, it is, it is um, very stepped as we go forward, um, but I agree with Eric. I mean, everything now is completely variable and that's the way that the owners look at it. And I think we were fortunate that the brands and the bigger management companies did react relatively quickly this time in terms of making those changes. Um, I don't recall them being as swift as this, Eric, the last two times, Never. Um, but they've been very flexible in terms of standards, et cetera. So think the hotel experience as a result will be very different the next 12, maybe even 24 months as a result, as the brands have, you know, lifted requirements for standards, which is a layer of fixed cost for all of us, um, and evaluate when to bring some of those things back. And I think, um, you know, what could be good news for, for some of the students and alumni on the line that work in operations, you know, as quickly as staffs were, were cut, um, as demand dropped off, the hope is, right, once demand comes back, that variable expense that Eric and Kim were talking about will come back because as demand occupancy rises, you need more staff and more people to service those guests in those rooms, et cetera. Um, so, you know, remains to be seen what that pace will, will look like. Um, I want to go to Leslie here. You know, you're in a, a unique position, you know, previously um, in charge of revenue management for a, a uh, hotel management company and, and portfolio of brands, but now starting your own business and growing your own management company and platform. Um, how are you approaching or modeling the staffing model and how has it changed, if at all, because of uh, because of COVID? You know, it's been it's complex because a lot of things have converged. Um, when I look at, it, at at staffing a a organization for a hotel management company now, trying to balance what a stabilized asset should support compared to what the current uh, business levels do support is a is a very complex struggling act. Um, where I could tell you where, where it's very clear to me what a normal stabilized hotel and, and its uh, revenue support should look like. Um, you know, where I, I'm a strong supporter for property-based, um, a revenue management professional. Uh, I'm a strong supporter for a single property dedicated um, revenue management professional. Yet at the same time, when you look at short-term oxy levels ranging anywhere from single digits to, to 30, 40%, those business levels don't quite support that. So it's been complex, especially in a starting organization uh, where, where I, or with a portfolio of hotels, uh, you don't necessarily have a portfolio of hotels on day one, on a phase schedule, uh, being able to make the right call of shifting, having been up, being comfortable uh, front loading more talent than you would normally carry and knowing that the business levels uh, will support it in the very short term. Interesting, thank you. Um, for, uh, for Roy, I um, wanted to ask you, you know, the challenges you're, you're seeing when it comes to STR reports. And, you know, what were, this was usually the report we use for, for tracking occupancy, ADR, RevPAR, et cetera. And now with hotels closing and reduced inventory, um, issues with segmentation because group blocks are essentially gone. Um, 
are you are str reports still the best medium for measuring effectiveness today um, and how do you think hotels should be measuring success um well i, I think that that star reports were never the best solution to begin with i think that it's it's a great way of looking at it. everyone looks at their report card but um what i tell all of my team and what i think that all revenue people that are listening to this and in general hotel people uh, right now is the time to make sure that we don't leave any stone unturned. Um, and that's from a, a profit perspective, from a revenue management perspective, from uh, anywhere we can find any money. So uh, how do you measure success going forward? You have to use star reports, but you also have to use everything else on top of it. Am I capturing every email that I possibly can capture? Am I making sure that every guest that I come into contact with, I'm trying to upsell every single one of them. Am I wowing every guest? I understand I'm at 30, 40% occupancy, but am I wowing them? So your balance scorecard may have had four quadrants before. Your balance scorecard now is like a 25 boxed report card. You have to be looking at so many different things right now to measure whether your hotel is successful. And in order to make gains right now, um, every, pen, every penny counts. So if you really want to be able to say, hey, I've been successful, have you turned over every single stone and made sure that you were optimal in every area in particular? It's not just looking at your star report saying, hey, you know, we had a great week last week, segmentation glance looked good, Tuesday, Wednesday, Saturday looked awesome, and I had some opportunity on Sunday, Monday, and Thursday. That's not enough anymore. I'm curious to get your reaction to that. Kim? Yeah, Kim. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. No, I, I mean, I agree. You have to do what you can in terms of capturing the revenue for the people in the building. We always have had to do that. Um, I mean, I rely a lot on Travel Click, which has a demand component to it where you can kind of measure on a go forward basis, um, which, you know, many revenue managers, it's a great revenue management tool. I mean, I look at that a lot. Um, and I, I think the other thing is it's not necessarily revenue, which he kind of alluded to in terms of profit. But I mean, you know, we keep going back to our, you know, the models that we developed, you know, three months ago when this first happened, that in order to operate the hotel, once you segregate back to your fixed variable cost, if you put your fixed cost aside, are you really covering your variable costs with the rate that you have and the labor that you have? I mean, it's a, it's a very different operating model than it was before. And it's, it's, you know, we spend as asset managers a lot of time just making sure everything's um, in check. But um, STAR is always a great report card. Um, but I think TravelClick has a little bit more weight to it at this point, just because it's forward looking and um, kind of can take out the noise of the hotels that aren't reporting and sees it on a total demand basis. Eric, what are your thoughts on that topic? I actually, I agree with what Kim said. Um, to me, I don't think STAR is, is a, great, um, a great tool. Obviously, you can look at it after the fact. But, um, you know, when you're, when you're operating at 17% uh, occupancy, you know, your competitor having four rooms more or four rooms less can have a, have a material effect on, on your you know, how you show in that. And to me, it's, it's about getting very granular and looking uh, at where the opportunities are, you know, looking at the demand reports to see uh, where you might be able to uh, make improvements. You know, as Roy had said earlier, looking at every detail to see, you know, are we, um, from a placement perspective, are we on the first page? Are we, um, you know, are we achieving everything. Are our guests having a good experience, you know, uh, when they're in-house and giving us uh, a good report after the fact? Those to me are, are the more important pieces. And uh, we're getting some, some great questions here from the audience. So I want to throw in one here by uh, Dave McElroy, uh, Boston-based uh, hotel broker. Um, you wanted to ask the panelists the pros and cons of travel click versus the uh, Calibri reports. Um, anybody want to tackle that one first? 
I, um, I can address it. I mean, right. Travel Click is a different, um, so Calibri um, is a company that has a platform and a program that takes data at the hotel level, like at the folio level from the PMS systems and is able, they've always been a big proponent of looking at the total cost of sales and OTA and how much OTAs have taken from our business. But they have a new platform called Hummingbird. And what Hummingbird does is it really, instead of looking in like Travel Click looks at things at one level, Star is at one level, Travel Click is at another level, and Hummingbird is the next level of detail in terms of analysis. And Hummingbird has the capacity to show you, like within the group segment, where the prop, where from on a net profit basis. Um, not just revenue, but revenue excluding the estimate of, of, of acquisition costs. They call it COPE revenue. And they take that and they show you and they can show you that by channel and by segment. So when you are, um, it is definitely another layer in terms of optimizing your revenue mix and profitability. And it needs to be used in conjunction with travel click would be my response. I think in a nutshell, uh... I love Calibri. I think it's great. Calibri. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I love it. <laughs> pronounce it. It's fantastic. Um, travel Click, in my view, right now is more applicable to what we're trying to get at. Uh, because Calibri or Calibri looks backwards and Travel Click looks, looks forwards. So, uh, Agency 360, I know a lot of people are canceling their Agency 360 contracts. God bless you and whatever you're trying to decide going forward. Um, but Travel Click helps you understand how things are shaping up in the future. The segmentation of a year ago, of last month, of two months ago, is not your segmentation moving forward. They're not the same IATA numbers, the same agencies that are booking you going forward. So to have a pulse on that, Travel Click is immensely helpful. Calibri gives you great insights going backwards, but in the current climate of where we're operating, I find that Travel Click is one of the most, if not the most important tools that we have. And uh, one other follow-up question. I'm actually curious, does anyone on the panel use hot stats? Uh, I know I've focused more on expenses, but does anyone uh, use these, their data for comparison? No. We do in, in uh, our hotels with our European platform, um, but we don't use it in the States. Um, I, I find that uh, it's, Given they're selling the data, it's a little too homogenized where, you know, we use benchmarks where we can look at individual properties that allow us to get much more uh, into the detail. Um, I've talked with Pablo about making changes to what he's doing, but so far he hasn't, uh, he hasn't made those. So, um, you know, when you don't have your own platform, it's a helpful tool because it's, you know, one tool is better than no tools, but if you have uh, a large enough sample that you can do your own work, uh, it's more, more beneficial to do that. Yeah. Um, got a question here from, from Peter uh, for the asset managers on, on the panel. Um, you know, I think as a follow-up to our, our discussion about variable, variable costs and how those have changed quite a bit, his question is, is it really a true indicator right now of the reduced costs? And I think he brings up a really good point here is that um, because of the PPP loans and EIDL, um, you know, once that period is over, which is coming relatively soon, you know, will the operation be able to sustain that staffing model into 2021? So curious um, to, uh, to Kim and Eric, uh, what, what do you think about that, that question and that topic? Um, I'll give you my two cents worth. I mean, we're, we're uh, running at a staffing model that um, I believe we can uh, run at long into 2021. Um, obviously not um, at the model that I described earlier, but um, where much more of it's variable. Yeah, I absolutely think that that's the case. And we have probably half of our properties that uh, got PPP uh, funds. Um, you know, there may be a little bit of extra staffing um, in those hotels than in the ones that uh, don't have it because that's what the owners have chosen to do. Um, 
but I won't say that it is materially affected uh, how the business is been run. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's going to change. I don't, I don't think operating into 2021 is going to be the issue. I mean, I think what we are facing as asset managers is, um, is dealing with you know, redeveloping, re-engineering, and renegotiating the deal itself, right? So it's talking to the lenders, it's talking to the franchise company, it's talking to the manager. It's not just the labor, we're looking at all of it, at all the core contracts at the hotel, all the people that the, you know, the hotel does business with. Um, so it is a very painful time, and it's a painful time on all of those realms. Um, so, I mean, I do think that, you know, as, as people, as things come to a head later this year into next year, unfortunately, there probably will be some hotels that never reopen, the ones that were struggling before, just like, just, I mean, think about what you're seeing at your local malls and your retail centers, right? Like, Nordstrom's is going out of business, Macy's is going out of business, like all these places are not reopening. I think we'll, we, we will see some of that in the hotel space as well. We'll have buildings and real estate that will not reopen and we'll have some that will go, you know, back to the lenders and be sold on, sold on a distressed basis and recapitalize that way. Um, because that's what happens this time in the cycle for us. This is what happened in the last two and it'll happen this time too. So it's less about operating, more so about what happens with the change of the building and who ends up owning it, who's owning it. It may not be the same company owning it 12 months from now. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, Kim. And, and just for everyone listening, if you're not tracking it every day, um, the number of transactions, hotels that have actually sold, is down over 80 or 90% uh, through the COVID months. I mean, we've seen essentially no transactions take place. And a lot of that is due to the forbearance that lenders have offered and uh, PPP loans from the government that have kept owners afloat and, and able to weather the storm, at least temporarily. So, you know, that's gonna be really interesting to watch going into Q3, which we're in now and Q4, um, when new ownerships or banks start uh, foreclosing on hotels, you know, how that changes the, uh, the landscape. Um, Jonathan, another question. that's really yeah. starting to thaw right now. Yep. Uh, I've seen a number of properties transact in the last uh, few weeks and we've seen a lot of activity, um, you know, for things that will uh, trade hands, whether that is uh, one owner to another or whether it's an owner to a lender, a lot of that's gonna start happening in the next, uh, you know, 60 days. And, you know, as you wear on into Q4, it's, it's gonna be a very hot market as, as Kim noted as well. For sure, for sure. I think those those forbearance periods are just starting to end now, mm -hmm. and lenders are trying to figure out, you know, what's what's going to happen next. So, totally agree with you there. Um, I want to throw in a question here from a uh, BU professor that um, was one of my professors when I was in school, and I know Leslie was in his classes as well, and probably Roy as well. Uh, Stan Buchan brings up a great point here. And what about the customer and all this? Because I know I, I, I fall victim to this all the time where I think about hotels from a P&L and profitability perspective and not always from the customer perspective. So how, how are their expectations changing um, with respect to service quality desired? Anybody want to take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, Kim, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think it varies by customer type and by tier. I think what we're seeing is that, that a lot at the luxury level hotels where people are still paying, you know, call it north of $300 rate, you know, they're still looking for services and they're still looking for what they looked for pre-COVID. I think the hotels that are open, um, you know, more of the business type hotels, the select service, core full service hotels, I think the people are understanding we're here, I'm hearing from the field that they're more understanding of the changes in the service and they understand it. I'm not sure how long that'll last, um, but currently it, it, it's based, it, that's, they're okay with it. I mean, they understand that what's happening because the world's a very different place and they see it in the whole, in the whole execution of their travel, right? They see it at the airport, they see it when they get in the Uber, they see it when they get to the hotel. 
I think that's well said. Um, and, and actually, even within a specific class of hotel, uh, some customers are more um, understanding than others. Um, you know, even, even though you, you know, you go out of your way to make sure that um, what they're going to get when they arrive at the hotel is clearly stated, you know, on your website and in other, other venues that you understand, many of them will still, well, not many, a few of them will still get to the hotel and uh, be upset because they're not getting what they expect, um, despite the fact that it may be a, may have been clearly posted uh, what that was. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, just from my experience over the last couple of months, um, and this can be a much broader conversation also, but I think it really depends where you are in this country. Um, you know, are you staying at a hotel in New York or are you staying at a hotel in a rural community in Michigan? Um, and I, I can tell you from I, uh, two weeks ago, I did stay at a hotel in Western Michigan and I can tell you, I, I was not um, really all that impressed with the level of cleanliness, um, with changes they were making, with requiring people to wear masks. You know, those things I think are being overlooked in, in certain parts of the country. Whereas you go to a hotel here in New York and they won't even let you in the door without a mask. Um, and they, you know, they have the, the Purell station set up. They have the the shields at the front desk, you know, I think it really depends where you are, what hotel, what brand, what management company, what owner. And, you know, as an industry, um, there's a kind of a diversity in um, how these properties are being managed. So from a customer perspective, you know, that's, uh, that's going to be a challenge because it's not going to be consistent no matter where you are. Um, so just an interesting anecdote there. Um, I want to shift the conversation now focus a little more on revenue management. Um, and let, let's start with, with Roy here. Um, you know, the new normal has put a lot of spending on pause. Where does or should technology surrounding revenue generation fall on the priority list of where to spend? Um, you know, for example, hotels previously did not fully embrace revenue management systems. And so is that RMS appetite growing or shrinking further in your, uh, in your viewpoint? Yeah, I think that if um, if the coronavirus was not a wake up call to the industry to start embracing technology, then I really don't know what will be that wake up call. Um, I look at this in, in two buckets, right? The, the short term bucket and the long term bucket. Uh, what are the things that we can do now? What is the technology that we can invest in now that's going to help us in the long term? And what is the stuff that's going to help us in the short term? So the things that help us in the short term may not exactly be a revenue management system. Maybe that is a little bit slightly longer term, certainly not so long term that you're going to wait until 2022. Um, but if you're not looking at agency 360, if you're not utilizing technology to understand where demand is coming from, if you're not utilizing technology to upsell appropriately, if you're not using as much technology to capture as much money as possible, then I don't think that, um, that we've entirely woken up. Our industry is uh, very reactive. So I think mean, this is like a wake up call to say, it's time to react, it's time to, to get into the technology thing. And I know I've heard it before and I'm, I'm sure there are people on the phones that are thinking this as well, but we don't have any money to spend. Um, we have to be creative business people first and foremost, and then second, we can become hoteliers. Let's be creative, find ways to work with partners, et cetera, to, to get into technology platforms, use the technology, and be a good partner to the people that we bring on board as well. And find a way to use technology so that we can be positioned right now appropriately in the distribution channels, technology-wise, et cetera, to make as much money as possible. But then once we do start to ramp, that we have a new business mix. And Leslie, you spoke to it earlier. Uh, you're an advocate of on-property revenue management. I am as well. But no hotel, in my view, is one size fits all. Many of our hotels are multiple hotels for one revenue person. And how have we got that way? Because we utilize technology. And it wouldn't be possible without that. If we want to be lean and continue to be lean going forward, we're going to have to embrace technology. 
and the consumer expectations are shifting as well. They're expecting more technology. Um, and that, I think that that's the end of my soliloquy. <laughs> Leslie, go ahead. Yeah, I think technology is one of the greatest enablers. I, I think we're, we're, we will continue to see the acceleration and shift of revenue management expertise. If you look back in, in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was about yield and distribution management. And now as we've accelerated 2020 and beyond, and I think it really is about uh, revenue management professionals should focus on distribution and guest acquisition. And I think that you've seen this in the last five years where more revenue management professionals have started to act like digital marketers, looked at other industries beyond the hotel business and how they utilize technology. Yeah, I think I'm gonna bring it back to the earlier point and Kim did a, a remarkable job um, along with Eric, talk, talk about the articulating differences between what Star does, which is mostly historical, what TravelClick does, which is mostly forward-looking, and then what uh, Calibri does, which is mostly uh, cost of acquisition, which by definition is a look-back basis. Um, what, I think one of the biggest missing things is that if you were to look at other industries, specifically for retail, specifically for digital marketing, you would find there are, there are other, gate, there are gaping holes in terms of missing technology that would give us a better viewpoint of guest acquisition, lifetime value of a guest, and other uh, business intelligence for revenue, ma revenue management professionals to, to execute and make far more informed decisions. Because no longer is it about pricing a room, distributing a room, now it really is about the full stack of rate product design, leading it powered by distribution, and then fully, ultimately up to guest acquisition and retention. So, Eric, curious to get your 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 viewpoint. You know, hearing from two revenue management folks there, you know, you're the one writing the check, right? So, how how do you feel about spending on on the technology? Well, I'll say um, if you're starting to do that now, um, you're behind. You're well behind where you should be. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is. Um, uh, since my arrival here at Pyramid, we've been spending um, and retooling our spending uh, to get more bang out of our uh, technology dollar uh, across our enterprise. And as it relates to the impact that that's had, I will say that um, we have done work that has eliminated a ton of work amongst our people, um, which in this crisis has allowed us to shrink more than we would have been able to otherwise. Obviously, I'm not talking about revenue management pieces, but to me, I think it's uh, there's a strong corollary between your ability to invest in technology and your ability to get more out of the individuals that you have working for you. Um, investing today, if you haven't invested in the past, is really difficult um, uh, unless you're really well capitalized. And the, you know, the challenge is that most, most technology investments require a people investment to put them in place as well. Um, and most companies you know, can't afford one, much less both at this point. But uh, I'm a huge believer in, in technology and I completely agree with what Roy has said. I think investing now is, is a really difficult thing to be doing, so. Kim, did you wanna add anything on the topic? Um, no, I think I mean I mean revenue management certainly is a is a worth is is a worthwhile investment. I agree with Eric. Now's a difficult time just because of you know where things stand in terms of the hotels in general. Um, but I do think that I do I am a believer that the revenue that the technology can still go to so far only can only go so far. Um, I mean, I like people like Roy sitting on the hotel and working on just one or two hotels and, and not 
the technology helps make their job easier, but it doesn't develop the strategy. It helps them with the execution of the strategy. I still like the people to develop the strategy on the revenue management side. I agree. I think, you know, some people think you buy these, these systems and you just press a button and go, Yeah. but now you, you need people like Roy and Leslie there to, you know, turn the dials, uh, right. you know, when, when needed. So I agree. Well, because technology is an enabler, right? Which means that if you could buy the system, many other people could buy the system. And ultimately it comes back to, well, you know, you, you could look at uh, maybe a poor analogy. You look at Formula One. Everyone has a multi-million dollar car. At the end of the day, there's only one winner of the race. And it still comes down to the execution um, of the person in order to win. Absolutely. Uh, next, next topic I wanted to touch on, and I'll just want to start with you, Eric. Um, you know, during prior downturns, you know, I think what's probably hurt the industry the most is reduction in rate, right? And the time it takes to get your ADR back to where it was pre-downturn. Um, what do you, what, what do you think? How, how might the industry, um, avoid some, some of those, um, rate reduction issues, you know, particularly given the extreme financial stress that owners are experiencing today? Uh, I tell you, this is one of the most regularly asked questions that we have within the industry. Um, and ultimately, I, I question whether we will be able to have the discipline uh, to do that. I will say so far, um, the discipline's been pretty good. Now, I think some of that may be that uh, so many people were furloughed that there's nobody left to change any rates. <laughs> but, um, Unfortunately, I apologize for laughing, but I do think you're right. <laughs> um, you know, I think the first is uh, in discipline and focus by the leadership uh, of the hotel and the leadership of the hotel's management company you know, making sure that uh, any changes in rate strategy are, are well thought out and uh, challenged uh, throughout the organization. Um, you know, I will say we have messaging throughout our organization that we're not going to be the ones uh, rate reductions. Um, and, you know, as it comes to uh, some of the uh, discussions around uh, what BT is going to look like this next year and, and whatnot. You know, I'm not sure that we're going to participate in, in uh, auctions and whatnot, because I just think it's the wrong, the wrong message to be sending. Um, and I guess, um, you know, I guess one of the other things that uh, we're doing uh, similar to what uh, Roy had said earlier is, you know, focusing on the value adds and, you know, premium room types and upsells and things like that to, to keep from, you know, in a, in a time like this, it's very easy to let those things fall by the wayside. But, you know, if you can get somebody to pay an extra $20 for a view room, you know, you can do that in a bad time. You have to try and do that now, or else uh, you're in a. You're just going to help to drive, uh, to drive that ship down. Yeah, and I, I know it's it's been it's been challenging for us on the side of projecting what rates might look like for the next couple of years because demand in in so many cases have just disappeared, right? So you're not even having a pricing conversation because your occupancy is 5%, 10%, whatever it might be. Um, so that, you know, it's just, it, it, you know, you, you can look at your decline in ADR on your star report month over month in June 19 versus June 20, but does that really mean anything because your occupancy is down 80% for whatever. Roy, what, what do you think about that? Um, do I think that rate, listen, I think rate strategy is, uh, kind of like the price is right. Anybody can pick a price. Um, it's up to us to manage how that price goes out there. So back to what Eric said, um, not all 109s are created equally. Um, so I look at it and I say we're in charge of making sure that we 
or on the first page that were visual to everybody, that were signing on new distribution channels, they were very creative. Um, on the reduction of price topic, um, I can say this until I'm blue in the face, market forces are incredibly powerful. Um, you do not decide the price. The revenue manager never, ever decides a price. If a revenue manager is deciding a price, they're picking it out of thin air, that's a hypothesis test that is not deciding a price. The market will tell you where your hotel can be priced. That's it in a nutshell. And in order to decide what type of conjecture we have going forward, I don't know. I mean, your best guess is my best guess. Where do ADRs continue to go? What does the market bear is my question. So when I tell the team, do elasticity testing. I don't know what the right price is. Test a price. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, then you have to change your strategy. That's kind of where we are right now. That's always where we work, right? If you were at 399, try 429. Try, if that doesn't work, 419, right? You have to elasticity test. And every price point, it's not just that retail price point that you see online. It's every price point that exists outside of what you see online. It's every price point that Eric mentioned earlier. BT prices have long-term implications. You take your BT prices down now, your recovery is not four years, now it's six or seven or eight. And then down the road, Kim is going to be having that discussion with some director of sales saying, hey, maybe we need to take this year and get out of this BT program. So every single price point, there's a lot of math that has to go behind it. We've got to stop just picking rates, saying we're going to hold rates. Holding rate is just like this thing that we just have made up. It's what the market demands and making sure that we very accurately, as to the best of our ability, test price elasticity. Would you agree, Cam, or kind of what, what have you seen at some of the hotels that you're, uh, that you're asset managing? You know, look, I mean, I think we, I think, you know, I certainly don't, you don't want to be the first one to bring down the ADR and bring down the rate. I do think it's always, it is like, you know, Roy said, it's always about the value proposition and every rate is not the same. Um, I think that the, um, the, you know, a lot of the brands have put holds on things like guest service and that type of stuff. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the, the commitment that Marriott or Hilton has or some of the way that the, the brands are approaching you know, their cleaning process and their protocols and how the hotels convey that and how they articulate it and how good the staff is to your example in Michigan, right, is part of the value proposition. When people start getting on those, going to those properties and getting on TripAdvisor and saying how amazing it was and they felt safe, then, you know, you have the ability to, to your values up and you have the ability to make an ADR change. Um, so I do think it is about value proposition. I do think that as we go through this recovery, that's what we'll be looking at as asset managers as an, as, and as an industry, every place in the country will be different, but you know, you know, if, you know, does somebody have room service or does somebody have a restaurant that's in the building that's actually open or is it only a grab and go? Cause a lot of us are pushing for grab and go because it's hard to open the kitchen and offer all of the services from a cost basis when your occupancy is so low. So I think as things continue to move, those are the types of things we're going to be evaluating. It's who's open, who's not, what's available, what's not, and how are, and being creative about how to handle all of those things and all of those services so that the customers, you know, are comfortable. Leslie, you want to jump in there? I do. Cause I, I you know, because I, I I operated similar to Roy's plan, execute, refine pricing methodology for a very long time. And in the last several years, I've seen how it could be done differently. And when I say done differently, it really is just differently. It doesn't mean better, nor does it mean that it's scalable for most people, especially in the context of whether you are a global mega multinational brand with 3,000 hotels, 1,000 hotels, or even 100 hotels. But I've definitely... I've been really, I've been thinking about this a lot, which is that um, I actually think that price is one of the largest signals of value. So, so when, when Roy makes a great point of saying, well, you don't really set a price, you have to factor in the marketing conditions to understand whether the market conditions support that price value proposition. At the same time, as I continue to study retail, 
more and more, one of the biggest things I learned from retail is that there is such a thing as uh, brand positioning and rate brand positioning which oftentimes if you look at a aspirational product, there is a fixed price point that people associate with it. So when you change the price and the value proposition of that brand, day after day, night after night, as we do with hotels, it causes a lot of confusion to the consumer of what is the value proposition that we're offering. Well, so I stress, and I've been, I've been thinking with this for a while, which is that, and exploring, what does it look like for a hotel that doesn't really materially change rates? And a lot of this will be further compounded and, and, and will be further more complex because as we all agree that it will take anywhere from 23, 24, 25 for rep power levels to rebound, the phase, the customer segmentation and the phasing of that rebound will look very different from market to market. Right now we're are in a very short term we're seeing the majority of travel is leisure oriented travel. Then the, the value proposition of leisure travel is very different from other segments of demand. So you'll see the value proposition change materially uh, over the course of this rebound over the next three years. Yep. All right, so um, we could probably talk for another couple of days on these topics, uh, but unfortunately we're, we're two, two minutes out from the hour. So I just wanna go around the horn once more and uh, you know, ask everyone if they've got any, any advice for students on the line or just kind of a last word on things you're looking for or um, um, you know, anything moving forward in our industry. Um, Kim, why don't you go first? Um, why did I have to go first? So, I mean, look, it's a very, it is a very, very, very unusual time right now. Um, hopefully it will get back to, you know, some new normal in the, you know, in, in the near future. Um, it's, this is where we as managers and as executives really learn how to really be good at what we do is because we're dealing with problems. Um, I mean, this is these are these are big problems: renegotiating contracts, asking le lenders for forbearance, all of those things. And I think just as in our in our in life right now and in our business, I, I think you have to ask for anything. I don't think just because the contract says that's what it was or that's the way things used to be done. I think that we do have the ability to make a lot of change and do what's best for, you know, the business overall on a go forward basis. And so I think you have to ask for anything. I think it's just that unusual of a time that you just have to ask for it. And I think a lot of times you're gonna get it. Uh, Roy, last word. Um, I would tell any students that are graduating that uh, your track pre-coronavirus and during coronavirus are um, not similar, but nothing in life is linear, right? You are going to get in a job. You are going to change your job eventually at some point anyway. Uh, this is a great opportunity for you to experiment and you will still get back um, to where you want it to be. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. So uh, two, three, four months is not going to jeopardize your 40, 50 year career. Agreed. Leslie? You know, I would say ignore the minutia and focus on the possibility. Um, it, it, Roy said it very well, which is that the, over the next coming months, it's, every little thing seems like a big thing. But when you really, if you, in the, in the context of time and the perspective of time, when you're able to zoom it back out, there is no better opportunity or time for people to try things um, that, that, that may not be possible before. Because they, they, whether they felt that it was impossible, whether they felt that was too big of a lift, um, but now it really is a time for people to start thinking things differently and take action with them. Absolutely. Uh, Eric. Yeah. Um, you know, as it relates to the students, I would say this is a great time, uh, to be, uh, in the industry and a great time, uh, to learn, right? This is, um, you know, when times are easy, Everybody couches themselves in, in uh, 
what's going on in the moment, but you know, desperate times make for uh, great learning opportunities and great opportunities for people to get ahead and to show themselves as, as uh, capable of doing more. And you know, the ones who win in these times are the ones who have strong focus and tremendous discipline um, and are able to adapt. And uh, you, know, you have those characteristics these are the times that you can thrive and put yourself uh, out in front of uh, out in front of this and and really capitalize on this opportunity. Well said, yeah. And so, um, fortunately, we are we are out of time for today. And I apologize. There's a lot of really great questions um, that we didn't have a chance to get to. Um, but I really want to thank our, our four panelists um, lending their time today for students and, and the industry folks on the line. Really great insights, you know, clearly best at your crafts. Um, so really appreciate on behalf of, of BU and, and everybody on the line. Um, I really enjoyed it. So thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>